Okay. So today I'm going to uh, finish the first part of our randomized clinical trial, which is the last part about static design. In the first part, I will pay more attention on the philosophy and the practical issues when you're trying to construct and perform a RCT. And the second part will be more focusing on the uh, 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 data analysis and interpretation. Okay. So first of all, let's start with the outline. The origin of a randomized control trial is a so-called natural experiment. So I've, I'm going to tell you what makes them different and what's the essential um, components for natural experiment and how it would be even better if we could perform uh, the study by randomized control trial. Again, I'll start with the prototype of the study design and the various modifications based on the prototype of RCT. Uh, we do it for different purposes. Uh, so it depends on the characteristics of the intervention and also the characteristics of the outcome. Uh, so then we need to modify the prototype to make it um, better in response to the, those specific characteristics. Okay, and I'll go into the details about the practical issues in conducting an, an RCT. The processes has to be um, uh, restrictively followed uh, because of the issue of the research ethnicity. Uh, so it's required by the uh, committee, the research ethnicity committee, blah, blah, blah. If you don't follow the rule, your research might be banned or something. It's a serious issue nowadays. Inevitably, we have to talk about the sources of bias in RCT. Uh, but uh, relatively speaking, uh, RCT is, is less likely to have a uh, bias uh, because basically it's a core study. So if you could prevent the people uh, leaving your research with, uh, with the unknown reason, then you should be fine about the uh, sources. And if you could follow the protocol you suggested and also approved by the IRB, and then it should be fine about the biases too. And uh, in the, the last part will be uh, the ethical aspects, which is requested by the law, no matter in America or in Taiwan, or in most of the country in the world. That's very important. Uh, so I have to remind you some basic rules suggested or requested by the law. And then uh, next week, we are going into uh, the details about how to perform the data analysis and how to interpret the outcome with some real examples. Again, there are several uh, essential indicators used to, to compare the um, um, effect, effectiveness of the uh, intervention, which is NNT and NNH. Uh, there are two indicators. But first of all, you need to understand the differences between efficacy and effectiveness. Talking about a natural experiment, uh, that's what people do. Oh, first of all, I have to tell you that I have a lot of experiences about RCT as a research subject, unfortunately, uh, not as a researcher. Because I was poor when I was in USA as a PhD student, so I joined a lot of the uh, random control trial for the purpose of uh, earn my own living. Yeah, it's uh, pretty worth it. Yeah, so I've done everything from my top of my body to the toe of my fingers. Yeah, if you try to control your fear against the needle and drawing blood, a lot of weird tests. Yeah, anyway, so I have a lot of experiences, especially about the ethical issues. I always beg them, would you please try it the other way to make me uh, less painful, uh, more comfortable with a final needle or something to make me feel uh, better, something like that, anyway. So natural experiment is the origin of uh, uh, randomized control trial. So before the epidemiologists start to perform a modern randomized control trials, uh, we use the method of natural experiment instead. What is so-called natural experiment? Uh, that's because most of uh, epidemiology study are just about observation. Uh, so it's pretty uh, unlikely to perform intervention, especially in a big scale in the very beginning. What we can do is to do the observation um, in two communities and they are not very different from each other in every aspect. Uh, then observation would be the first step. And then maybe we could uh, perform some intervention. But first of all, we have to make sure that that makes no harm for the intervention. Uh, because uh, you need to have evidence to convince the authority to let you do it, right? 
OK? And the basic example is the salt iodization, uh, which is the cause of the thyromegaly. Uh, I'll show the pictures or figures uh, next slide. Uh, if you have uh, iodine deficiency in diet, then you're more likely to have the, uh, the disease called uh, thyromegaly. Uh, although it's kind of apparent, you can see swollen thing on the neck. But um, uh, it also caused uh, a series of uh, diseases. Uh, but uh, the well accepted idea is to use the uh, salt iodization. Uh, so we just add the uh, iodine in, in the salt. And uh, uh, the disease, the frequency of the disease is minimized uh, afterwards. And the other example is the, uh, to add the fluoride in drinking water for the purpose of the, uh, prevent the dental caries, especially for the children. But um, every, no matter what you do, uh, something, there's something good, positive, or there's always something bad. And uh, the uh, adding flu fluoride in the drinking water uh, might make your uh, teeth more fragile, fragile uh, so it's broken easily. Uh, so nowadays, not many countries uh, do, do it in a community. But no matter for uh, salt iodization or fluoride in drinking water, you have to make sure that you have very strong biological evidence before you can do it. That's how you can convince the people to accept it as a kind of public health policy. And here's the figure about uh, thyromegaly, uh, which is the uh, medical term. Uh, but it's the, uh, a lay person or a mature name is goiter. Uh, it's pretty common when I was a kid. Okay, when you're in a train or in a bus, uh, you can see some people that have the, the problem. Yeah, especially for female. And you could see uh, people who live in the high mountain or remote places that are more likely to have the, the problem of thyromegaly. It's not really fatal, but uh, it may cause some uh, consequent physical problems because the thyroid is essential for living. Uh, if you want to survive, you need to have thyroid normally working there for you. But before we go into the details of, for the introduction of what a random, uh, randomized controlled trial is all about, I have to uh, introduce the idea about the strength of evidence. Okay? The worst one is the opinion of respected authorities, or like a, a whole bunch of the experts in this field, because what they do is generally based on clinical evidence or descriptive studies or reports from expert committees, or just kind of the experiences without strong evidence about it. Um, and a little better one is the evidence from well-designed non-experimental, or I mean, without a proper comparison group. Uh, a lot of studies are like that. From more than one center or research group, uh, like case series. Uh, the, the study of case series is done, are done without a proper co uh, comparison group. Uh, because of that, this is not uh, a good one either. Okay, so generally speaking, case series will be more um, likely used to describe the disease, characteristic of disease in the very beginning of an emerging disease, like what we did for COVID-19 three years ago. Okay? It's not very useful to generate evidence which is useful uh, to, to be applied in a public health policy or intervention or clinical treatment. Okay. And a little, bit of, a little bit better one would be the evidence, the evidence from well-designed trials without randomization. Okay. Single group pre-post or cohort or case control studies. Huh. So basically, this group of studies are observational or not well-designed uh, well trial without, randomiz without randomization. Randomization is the soul or the spirit, not the foundation for randomized control trial. So if it's not properly done, then it's be similar to the uh, observational studies, like core study, case control studies. Okay. And the second best one will be the strong evidence from at least one properly designed randomized controlled trial or of appropriate size. So size does matter here. So that's why when we try to develop a new vaccination, we request to, uh, to provide at least a couple of thousands of subjects, right? To, have, uh, to generate a sufficient statistical power. So random, well-designed and properly uh, performed, conducted randomized control trial will be the second best. And the best one will be the strong evidence from at least one systematic review of multiple well-designed randomized control trials. So even if you could perform an almost perfect randomized control trial, it's just a single study. So it's also still possible that there's a so-called alpha error 
I mean, the, the, actually there's no effect, but it could happen by chance with a, a chance of 5%, remember, alpha error, right? So if you perform the same studies in a better way in many different places, and the cumulative alpha or type one error will be limited. So that's why that the top one is the ones with the systematic medical review or even meta-analysis, uh, multiple well-performed, well-designed and performed randomized controlled trial. Okay, so see, the uh, top three uh, will be about randomized controlled trial, randomized controlled trial, randomized controlled trial. Uh, so randomized controlled trial should be the one, the best evidence ever, uh, but it's not always feasible. It could be very expensive. So there's still some limitation about it. Okay, but let's talk about the advantage of it. Okay, huh? I told you that it could provide a stronger evidence of causality in the previous slides, right? And also the best part about RCT is that it could address the issue of confounding at the stage of study design. You don't even need to worry or spend or make too much, too many efforts and uh, uh, data analysis stage to sort it out for confounding, okay? Because of the uh, randomization is an essential part of it, right? And the randomization will be able, theoretically, uh, it will be able to, um, to address the issue of confounding, confounded properly, even if you don't know they are confounders. Uh, I'll show you more details about it later, uh, but you have to know that there are RCTs uh, could provide the strongest evidence, and there's a reason. There are many, many reasons, not only one reason, right? And also, it does, it's the only possible way to uh, perform some kind of research, research like uh, the development of a new medication, right? Because it does not exist in the nature, so you have nowhere to uh, do the observation on the effectiveness or efficacy um, for the uh, uh, medication at all. So that's the only way we could do it. Yeah. So that's why there's a lot of concern about the ethical issues, because you have to make sure that it makes no harm right, for people's health before you can uh, really perform such a randomized controlled trial uh, with the development of new medication. So, so that's why we need to perform a lot of animal studies right, before we could do it on human body. It may be Faster than observational study uh, for some occasions, uh, not always true. It may be cheaper than observational study, uh, but not always true. <laughs> Maybe, right? As an epidemiologist, our dream is to publish our articles in top journals, okay? And there's an example that uh, there's a study published in Nature. That's the top of the top journal in the world, right? But as an epidemiologist, what, mostly what we do is observational study. And people always argue that, ah, oh, you did not consider the confounding from this and that, right? So it's very unlikely that you could publish an uh, epidemiological study in such a kind of journal like Nature. But there's an exception. If you can do something like an RCT, uh, which could provide the best evidence, then it's possible to publish an article like this. Uh, the antibody uh, jucanomab reduces uh, alpha beta plagues in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is an RCT, uh, which is published in uh, 2000, 2015, right? about six, seven years ago. Yeah? Although eventually it has been proven it's not true <laughs> because this is only one study, right? And people tried to repeat it but failed. Okay? But at least it's been published in uh, uh, Nature. So if you have the same dream to publish an article in top journal, RCT will be a good way to do it. Okay, so here's the prototype. Again, it's very straightforward. And does it look very similar to what? Core study, see, right? We have, this, we have a population, we want to, the target population we want to refer our research results to. And we have a sample, exposure, no exposure, and follow up. What's the only differences between a randomized controlled trial and a core study? Here, randomization, right? In core study, people choose to publish to something like smoking, or they have no way to reject the exposure like a genetics factors is given by your parents, right? Or, or environment like uh, climate change. No one can avoid it unless you immigrate to Mars or something, right? So, for a core study, people are exposed uh, by themselves or somehow. For 
randomized controlled trial, we can assign them the exposure status, no matter on the treatment or the placebo by randomization. That's the only differences. So typically, they are almost the same in every aspect, comparing randomized controlled trials to a core studies. Okay, but the only difference is randomization. Uh, so first of all, people have to be at risk for the outcome, exact the same, right? And exposure happened before the outcome, exact the same, right? And the timing is also exact the same. Uh, it's a prospective one, right? So the only difference is the way they receive the, the treatment or exposure. And in a randomized control trial, we might call the exposure as treatment or intervention more. But in core study, we call them exposure. But actually, they are exactly the same thing. Intervention, treatment, or, or exposure, the same, right? And placebo is not doing nothing. It's not doing nothing. We have to do something, right? But it's not the treatment. It could be the regular treatment. Uh, or we give them something look exactly the same, test exactly the same, exactly the size, shape, something, something to make them uh, to, to make the subject very difficult to discriminate the differences. Yeah, that's so-called placebo. Oh, it's not doing nothing. Okay. So and then we follow up for a period of time, which is relatively shorter. It could be a couple of days or weeks. It's not possible to perform a study and follow up for 10 years or 20 years. Anyway, but we could observe the proportion or the incidence of the diseases afterwards. Okay, but it's not necessary that the treatment is used to prevent something. It's also possible that treatment make harm. I mean, the, it might uh, in, uh, decrease the risk of dying from cancer, but increase risk of cardiovascular disease, right? We call them a secondary outcome. The primary outcome would be this, what we are interested in, right? But for secondary outcome, it's something else. We do care about the side effect or the other um, benefit or adverse events because of the treatment. That could be all observed at this uh, at a later stage. Okay, so this is so-called a prototype. Yeah. And because of the um, introduction or the application of randomization, uh, it makes the RCT the, as the most uh, rigorous methodology in epidemiology. In other words, there are a lot of rules to be followed to perform a, a randomized controlled trial. So the, the basic steps uh, is like that. First of all, we need to select a sample representative to the target population. Hey, exact the same as what? Core study. And we measure the baseline variables. Uh, I will tell you why we need to do the measurement. Although randomization is the method that we could make sure that the distribution for everything will be exactly the same, theoretically. But the uh, measurement on the baseline variable will, will, will be able to help us to make sure that it works. Okay, I'll show you why, especially at the stage of the data analysis. Uh, the first step to do data analysis is to, to compare the uh, baseline variables uh, to see if the, everything is balanced in terms of age, gender, severity of disease, blah, 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 all the things are similar to each other. And then we have to apply the random allocation or random assignment uh, to the different treatment arms. Uh, arms here means groups, the treatment group and uh, uh, placebo group, uh, we call them arms. Uh, that's because the pharmaceutical companies or experts in the uh, pharmacology, they like to use it. And then they start to, uh, we could start to apply the intervention no matter for the treatment group or the placebo group. And then we'll follow up for a period of time which is, has to be reasonable, which is, depends on the characteristic of the outcome or the disease. And then we measure the outcome variables uh, blindly, uh, if possible. Uh, I mean, the ones who, who measure the outcome has to be someone have no idea, having no idea about the exposure status, okay, to avoid what, bias. Uh, no matter information bias or selection bias. And finally, you could start to do the data analysis and try to do uh, uh, interpretation of the data. Okay, so that's the fundamental uh, steps. One of the skills that uh, we could apply is so-called the run-in design. Uh, that's the, uh, one of the methods which is particularly useful for the development of a new medication uh, to increase the proportion of study subjects who comply with the intervention follow-up procedures. Uh, sometimes the medication is very useful, uh, but they test badly, uh, like queening. Have you ever tested queening? Very bitter. 
okay, or sour, or look ugly, right? So if you could start to uh, perform wrong design before you start the uh, randomization, uh, that will be uh, useful to increase the compliance. When we have a, a try to get a random sample from the target population, and we perform the treatment to every single one to make sure that the side effect will not be too strong or the taste will be not too strong um, to make them um, um, comply with the intervention afterwards. Yeah, but the problem is the effect of treatment cannot be too long. Right? The, the, the effect may, has to be something that would be uh, disappearing in a day or in a week. Right? Then we could start to perform the treatment or placebo. Um, so we perform the randomization after the uh, wrong in phase for the treatment in the very beginning uh, to make sure that everybody can tolerate the treatment uh, in the very beginning. And everything will be exactly the same afterwards. Uh, that is so called wrong in design or wrong in phase uh, of the uh, randomized controlled trial. Uh, this is the wrong in phase. Okay. And the other possibility is to perform such called uh, factorial design. The objective is to answer two separate research questions. How? In a single sample of subjects. Because we could allocate or assign two different interventions in one uh, sample uh, like this. Uh, and the purpose is to study interaction. I'll show you why. Uh, factorial design. Do you know factorial? Factorial design. It's kind of dancing, right? Okay, so uh, because we have two methods of treat treatment or intervention here, A and B, so uh, basically we have to uh, split them into four groups by randomization. Okay, and the first group is drug A and B, the second one is drug A but placebo B, placebo A but drug B, and the placebo A and B. Uh, so there are four kinds of combinations for two interventions, okay? And then we all follow up the, for exactly the same thing here, but now we have four groups. So if maybe drug A and B is working, so the, the disease will be lower or something, it'll be different anyway. And then the comparison, the comparison of the, this drug A placebo B to placebo A and B, that'll be the pure effect of what? Drug A, right? And the placebo A drug B group compared to placebo A and B, that'll be the pure effect of what? Uh, uh, drug B, right? And the comparison of the drug A and B to the placebo will be the additive effect from A and B, right? So if this is like a do, mi, but this is la, so just jump up, right? <laughs> so there might be some interaction. O, do, le, so, right? It's not, they, are, they are conflicting each other, right? Yeah, that's interaction. So factorial design will be very helpful for us to create the, a, a scenario or a situation to do the comparison, to show you the pure effect for each one and also the effect from interaction. Oh, so that's so-called factorial design. Yeah, it's pretty uh, popular in the uh, field of epidemiology randomized control trial now. And the other possibility is to do so-called time series design. So it's just compared to themselves by the historical way. They put themselves as a historical control anyway. Uh, the step is that we select a representative sample from the population, uh, which is exactly the same. And then we measure the baseline variables, uh, including the outcome variable, which is also the same. But we don't do the randomization. We just apply the intervention to every single one in the cohort. Uh, and then we follow up and then took it away. And then we measure the uh, outcome variable again uh, to see what happened. Uh, it's kind of before and after design. If the effect of the intervention is not long because we know that, uh, then we could take it away and then do it again, take it away and do it again uh, to see the differences. Uh, so like what I said, that we could remove it and put it back, remove it, take it back. So if it's really effective, but not too long, then we'll be able to see that do, mi, do, mi, do, mi, right? That's right, do, mi, do, mi, do, mi. Oh, it's like that. But for this kind of study design, the, the every, every stage, they are perfectly matched to the previous stage, right? So the statistical analysis might be a little bit different. 
And the other thing is that uh, uh, when you're doing it for many, many times, the probability of missing might be higher and higher, which could be selective, right? So there are a lot of issues to be taken care of for this kind of study design. So it's not really very helpful. Yeah. And how do we know that the effectiveness, the duration of effectiveness are the same for every single one, right? Uh, so there are a lot of issues going on, uh, but some people did it. Uh, just present and future, uh, and you could do it repeatedly. Okay. The other thing is about crossover design. Uh, the objective is to make the between group as well as within group analysis. Uh, I will show you what is so-called between group and uh, within group analysis in the next slide with a figure, uh, which is much more understandable. And this method could enhance statistical power, yeah. but the limitation is that the effectiveness of the treatment cannot be too long because it might carry over to the next stage, right? So this is how we do it. Uh, it's the same. Target population, we've got a random sample and randomization, and then some of them will start with the placebo in the first stage, and the other group um, were on uh, treatment, right? And after a certain period of wash out, Period because we know that uh, the effectiveness of the efficacy of the, the treatment will disappear or vanish in two weeks, for example. And we just swap them. Uh, the placebo group become treatment group, and the treatment become placebo group. Uh, so it's so-called so -called crossover design. Okay? It's different from factorial design. We have two groups only here. Right? And then we can perform the between group comparison. Right? And within group comparison. Right? Okay, because of study design, we could perform two kinds of the data analysis. But why bother to, to create such a stu not stupid, so a comple complex design? Because this study design will be able to enhance statistical power. So we don't need to, we, we just need to have half of the uh, sample size, but we could generate the same uh, statistical power like a uh, double sample size. Uh, but it's very important that uh, we could wash out the effect of the treatment. If the effect of treatment is not possible to be washed out, then it might not be feasible. Uh, like a health education. If you tell people that uh, this is bad for your health, don't do this, don't do that, and then it might be hard to take it away, right? You cannot wash their brain, right? Yeah, so it really depends. Uh, this might be only useful for the medication with a very short uh, effectiveness period. So here are the slides about the uh, prototype and the modification for different purposes. Yeah, but it's very important to understand and make sure that you know why we need to perform the, such kind of study and why or how randomization would, would be very helpful for us to do confounding control. Okay, and all the modification could be done for different purposes. So now I, I'll go into the practical issues about how to perform a well-designed, well-conducted uh, randomized controlled trial. Okay, first of all, that's very important to make sure that you have fixed the criteria for recruitment. Uh, it'll be better to make it ready down in document, yeah, and don't change it during the process of your research. If you do it, it will be a potential source of what? Selection bias, right? Okay, like what we do for case control study. We have to make sure that the definition of a case uh, don't change from the beginning to the end of the process of data collection. And there's no element of subject decision making on subject selection. So since the criteria is there, then you have to do it uh, with a very restrictive way. Uh, there's no subject decision making. In other words, if someone don't qualify as your research subject, even if he or she beg you or threat, threaten you, you have to say no, right? You can sort it out somewhere else, but, but not in your research, okay? And all the principles applied must be replicable. In other words, the rule has to be very clear uh, in uh, any kind of language anyway, but it has to be something repeatable or, or replicable in anywhere else in the world. Uh, by the other investigators. That's science, right? If some medication only works in one clinic, that's problematic, right? It might be highly selective. They might not really uh, define the cases properly or no randomization or something. There are too many reasons to, to go wrong, 
right? But that's the only one reason to do it right, right? What is the reason? Learn epidemiology from me. When we are trying to set the uh, eligibility criteria, there are some rules to be followed. The first one is to, we have to tell them that there are potential benefits and risks, something good and also something bad for the intervention. It's not possible that something is always good, right? So we have to raise the potential risks to the um, people who are taking your research. Right? So when you are uh, set, setting the eligible, eligible eligibility criteria, you have to make sure that you have a clear idea about the potential risks. Uh, then you could tell them and they can make the decision themselves. And we have to keep the internal uh, validity. Uh, that's defined as the ability of subject to provide valid and reliable data, uh, like uh, intact uh, mental status. Uh, so you might need to exclude the people with a certain mental disorder, like dementia, right? Because he or she might not be able to answer your question properly. And also, they might, be, might need to be influenced in certain languages. In America, it might be English and Spanish, and maybe Mandarin, and Cantonese, right? <laughs> so which will cover maybe 80% uh, or 90% of people. In Taiwan, they might need to be fluent in uh, Taiwanese, and the Mandarin, and maybe Hakka, Hakka language, yeah, to cover most of the people, to ensure that the generability is not too bad, right? Uh, and that's the so-called internal validity. So the internal validity will be helpful to show us the, the expected compliance with the regimen or the, in the running period. And with, the in, with a study with a high internal validity, it should be the study with a low dropping out rate. Why? Because if someone drop out, you might not be able to find them at all, right? You don't know why, then you have no way to address it. Uh, the only way you can do is to avoid it. So it's a typical what? Selection bias, right? So if a study with a high dropping out rate, then it'll be very likely that it's not, it doesn't happen by chance. And also the, the reason why they left your research might be related to the outcome. So it's a perfect storm for selection bias. When you're trying to uh, perform a random control trial, it's less likely to have such kind of thing. But uh, if you have a high dropout rate, oh, that'll be problematic. Okay, and there's something uh, called uh, external validity. It's more about generability. Uh, when you are trying to set up the uh, exclusion inclusion criteria for many, many reasons, uh, you might find out that eventually you restrict your research group in a very specific people, a specific characteristic of the people uh, who could join your research. Uh, then the generability, generability will be limited or restricted. So in other words, your research outcome might not be able to generate it to all the people. Uh, if you study about diabetes, then it cannot be generated to all the people with diabetes. It might just only uh, restrict to the people, for example, at earlier stage of diabetes or restricted uh, ethnicity or age groups. When we are trying to establish the eligibility criteria, we have to think about the issue about how to enhance statistical power. Uh, so crossover study is one of the way, right? And the other way is to make sure that the, the two groups in different arms uh, got similar number. I will tell you how to make it. And one of the possibility is to restrict the, the subject to a high risk group of relevant outcomes. So you don't need to follow up for a very long period of time, or you don't need to have a huge sample size uh, to have sufficient uh, statistical power. Uh, in other words, the people who are more likely to uh, have the uh, outcome or disease or the consequence of the uh, intervention, then you, have, uh, you will have a higher statistical power. And homogeneity will be the issue that um, if you got uh, study subjects or study uh, sample with a high homogeneity, uh, then you could reduce residual variability in the outcome. Okay, so there are many, many ways to enhance statistical power. But these are the two reasons when you are uh, considering the eligibility criteria. And of course, because you are trying to assign the exposure right, at the stage of randomization. Of course, you could perform matching. In terms of statistics, that's one of the ways to enhance statistical power. Uh, so when you do randomization, at the process of randomization, you could perform matching. Uh, I'll show you how uh, in the following slides. Okay, one, we need to establish the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, the major consideration is about 
find a balance or trade-off point, the optimal point for representativeness versus um, homogeneity. If you want to increase representativeness, the homogeneity might be need to trade off, right? So it, it's hard to find a, the best point to do that. It's to perform randomization. That's the best part and the most important part for any randomized control trial. Because randomization could adjust the potential confinement which are unknown or hard or costly to measure, which is not ever possible by any other methods in confounding control, okay? So it's so powerful, it could even control something unknown as a potential confounder. That's great. So you don't need to do anything, you just do appropriate randomization. And it could be almost perfectly taken care of, right? The simplest way is a simple random allocation. Uh, just a lucky draw for everyone who qualified or eligible for your research, right? Just lucky draw. And zero means that placebo, and one means uh, treatment, for example, or the other way around. But he or she has to be blind about the lucky draw outcome, right? But you keep it for the records for your own use later. Uh, but the one who evaluate the outcome has to be blind to the uh, lucky draw. Uh, this is a simple random allocation. Subjects are simply assigned by some pre-specified rules like lucky draw uh, or random number. Uh, even number means this and uh, odd number means that uh, in a random process. So it's very easy and straightforward like a simple random sampling, right? Basically a lucky draw. But if you have a study uh, which is pretty small uh, because it's expensive or then it might result in a fairly large difference in group size. Uh, because of a budget issue, you could have only 20 people. So ideally, you have 10 in this arm and 10 in the other arm, right? But since it's decided by random, uh, by the random process, um, and then it's possible that you have two and 18, uh, or even one and 19, right? And the most extreme possibility is that zero to 20, then how are you going to do it uh, for the next step? So it could just simply happen by chance, uh, no matter uh, for, for, for imbalanced uh, uh, numbers. Uh, so we could apply something like a randomly permuted blocks. Uh, it's not important about the term. Uh, the most important thing is about knowing how to do it. Uh, this is uh, the way we do it. Subjects are first grouped in pairs or blocks by their characteristics. Okay, that could be gender. So if you have uh, one subject who is a male in the age of 30, then just try to find another male also in the age of 30, for example, then they are in the same pairs or the same blocks. Okay, and then you perform the uh, randomization. So it could be the time of entry, uh, just the closest one with the exact the same characteristics, uh, with the exact same uh, uh, potential confounders. Uh, so it's just like matching. Right? But it just, it do the assignment uh, to the subjects to different intervention groups randomly. Uh, so if you ask one to do the uh, lucky draw and the other one will decide it at the same time. Right? So if even is uh, for treatment, for example, the art would be for placebo. And the other one in the pair would be automatically assigned to the other group. Right? Then in the end, for the whole process, we're pretty sure that the, the number of the people in the different arms will be exactly the same, right? And also we could perform matching in the process to make sure that the composition of the factors we do care, uh, like age and gender, will be exactly the same in these two comparison groups, right? So it's kind of a very interesting, useful way, right? Then we could assure that the, the, they're nearly equal uh, for each group. Uh, and then we could also enhance or maximize the statics of power. Okay, so this is called a randomly permuted uh, blocks. Okay. Blindness will be the other uh, uh, skill which is very useful. And some people call it a masking, uh, masking of blindness. The purpose is to prevent the measurement bias. Okay, so is it information bias or selection bias? So we've learned it, think about it. What is so-called measurement bias? Is it selection bias or information bias? Because it knows something about exposure status 
and when you are doing the measurement for the outcome or for the assessment for the side effect, something might went wrong, right? Then, what kind of bias is it? Yeah, information bias. And also it could prevent premature dropping out because the subject has no idea about which group he or she was in. And also the, the one who measured the, the outcome or baseline measurement have no idea about the exposure status. Uh, so so it's, it could not be selective. And which may otherwise differ between intervention groups. Uh, so is this the way to prevent a selection bias or information bias? Dropping out, right? It's a typical way of something happening in a cohort study, remember? If the reason why they stay or the reason why they drop out, the stay will be fine. For the ones who left without telling you any reason, they'll be very likely to have what? What kind of bias? Of course, it's possible for information bias, but it's more about selection bias here, okay? Like what happened in a cohort study. The skill or the methods of blindness or masking uh, could not only decrease information bias uh, by the first way, and also possible to avoid selection bias in the second way. Okay, so it's great, it's important, uh, don't forget it. So who could be blind? Everybody could be blind, right? But the study subject has to be blind. They have to be blind, okay? If they know something or they were hinted for something, then everything could be changed, right? And experts who assess the outcomes uh, in the end, uh, you might need to hire another group of people to do the assessment. Uh, they might need to qualify for something like nurses or, or, or physicians or at least a trained uh, research assistant uh, to know, uh, to measure the outcome. And also the caregiver, what is so-called caregiver? That could be their GP, general practitioner of family medicine, right? And, and also it could be the caregiver at home, uh, home caregiver. Uh, if it's, um, it's a disease with, uh, for uh, serious, if it's a serious disease, uh, there might be a home uh, caregiver uh, at home. Statistician, they have to be blind to the intervention group. But you might ask, but how, how are we going to make them blind? Yeah, you could just give them, oh, this is group A, group B, or group alpha, group beta. Right? You don't need to tell them, oh, this is intervention group and this is the uh, uh, placebo group. Uh, so the statisticians could be blind. But you might need to give the uh, note to the caregiver for the GP. Uh, in a Western country like UK or America, you need to tell them, their family uh, doctor, that uh, this person is joining our study. So potentially he or she ex might expose to the intervention medication, blah, 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 to give them some idea to assess the risk for the other treatments, okay? So that's important. How can we evaluate the, the effect of the brightness? You could do that. At the end, ask the subjects for their best guess about which intervention they were in to assess the psychological effect, okay? It's as in, what do you think? Which group are you in, right? Yeah, and sometimes if the intervention, the side effect of intervention is kind of strong, they might be able to figure it out. Yeah, but the best scenario is that they have no idea about uh, which group they were in, right? They could avoid the problem of the psychological effect. Okay, non-compliance. Uh, that's one of the important issue. Uh, it could be dropped out, like what I said, that uh, and the, some people just left without, tell you, without telling you what's happening. So, but at least you could keep the records for the best, basic characteristics to assess what happened. It might be the people who got high socioeconomical status or low education or more female or more, female, or more male or, or younger or older, right? To have some idea about what's happening. And also if possible, we could check uh, if the compliance or totally applied, if possible, like urine test. I mean, the people who are, they pretend that they are in, but actually they are out, right? They are in the intervention group, right? But they might not take it at home, right? They might say, oh, I'm going to do it in front of you, but actually they don't do it. That's drop out, right? It's actually a drop out. Yeah, so it could happen by some reason, yeah? So uh, drop out could be a source of selection bias. But we could test their urine to see if they really take the medication, right? Also, it's possible to drop in. How could it be possible? 
yeah? Because it could happen in this way, the control groups, or I should say the placebo groups, it's not a good term. Control group may make you feel like a case control study, right? But right here it means the placebo group. I'm going to change it. Placebo groups uh, might take the agent themselves, uh, like OCT, over the counter, which means that those medication could be taken without prescription. Uh, they could buy it in a supermarket or drugstore anywhere in Taiwan. Yeah, it's likely. Yeah, okay. So they, they just take it for some reason, like uh, acetaminophen, right? It's uh, available, in, in, it contains in any kinds of the flu uh, medication, right? So they could ac accidentally drop in uh, because they catch a cold. And be mostly cause the bias is shifting to now. No matter it's drop out or drop in, right? So the ones who are supposed to expose to the treatment just mistakenly to the other group, right? So mix up. So no matter drop out or drop in, will be most likely to bias shifting to now to make the difference is not that big. Yeah, but uh, not always true because this is a potential what selection bias, right? So it's very hard to predict the direction of bias. Although it's more likely to be shifting to now, but we cannot guarantee that. Okay? Now this is non-compliance. Okay, sources of viruses uh, in uh, RCT. Uh, the first and the most likely uh, source of virus is inadequate randomization. Is there a solution for this? Yeah, of course. If you follow the rule, like what I suggested in the previous slides, uh, that's the best solution. Or, or you could double check after you've done the randomization. You could compare their uh, baseline characteristics like age, gender, social, economical status, blah, blah, everything. And even the outcome. If the outcome is blood pressure, uh, then you could do the comparison, right? And this kind of statistical comparison, we're expecting to be no significant. Right? If they are significantly different from each other, then something went wrong. Right? So there are two ways to uh, make sure that the randomization was properly done. Okay? Follow the rule and also do the baseline comparison uh, right after you've done the randomization. Oh, that's very important to make sure that you are not too more, your research is not too vulnerable for such kind of very basic problem, right? It's possible that uh, they might failure to blind to accessible outcomes. Yeah, it might be a little bit different, a little bit difficult, but also again, you could try to manage it by some administration skills to make sure that the outcome were not were, were assessed by some, someone who are blind to the exposure status. And the worst part was the scenario is a failure to uh, follow up all the patients in the trial or failure to include all the data in the analysis. Uh, I put the underline here because this is very important uh, to apply a specific skill in data analysis. We are going to talk about it later. Okay, and the first bit, all the patients in the trial to uh, failure to follow up, there is a potential bias from what? about selection bias. Uh, so there's no solution for that. Uh, the way, the only thing we can do is to avoid it. But for the failure to include all the data in the analysis, uh, we have a solution about it. Okay, so dynamic. Before World War II, there's no uh, specific rules when we are trying to perform a randomized controlled trial or any clinical trial to human beings. So it happened for several in different places like uh, Nazi, German, and occupied area by Japan. Uh, they used human beings for some brutal studies. So after World War II, people start to um, think about the issue, how to make sure that ethical issues were properly uh, addressed uh, by all the uh, human subject study. So in 1964, uh, there's a World Physician Conference, something like that, in Helsinki, in Finland that declare a very important document about ethical issues in human subject studies. Uh, so the idea from the ethical consideration for randomized control trial were, were pretty late actually. And also a doctor, a physician called Henry Beecher, uh, he, who is very famous in this field of the research ethics, 
Uh, he wrote an article published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1966, two years after the Helsinki Declaration, entitled as the uh, Ethics and the Clinical Research. Uh, I even tried to find it. his picture. It does not exist in last year's slides. Yeah, I find his picture and in uh, Massachusetts General Hospital archives for the spatial collections. Uh, this is uh, Henry Beecher himself. So he initiated uh, the idea about how to protect people. And the last thing is about the, another document called the Belmont Report, uh, which is about the National Research Act in 1974. Belmont Report, Belmont might be the name of the congressman or woman who initiated the idea about how to protect people's definite uh, and comfort needs and everything for people who are involved in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, so here's the website I found for you that you can find everything about the Belmont report. Uh, but you can see it in the, uh, the, uh, the subtitle, Ethical Principles and Guidelines for the Protection of Human Subjects of Research. So that's how or why we have to follow all the rules about randomized control trial. Because it's pretty difficult and sometimes take a lot of time to get approval. So that's why in epidemiology we do observational study for the most of the time rather than intervention. But the importance of randomized control trial is increasing. It becomes more and more important because we are people or investigators or scientists are trying to sort it out to develop some new medication or new treatment methods. That's the only way we could perform it. Right? We cannot observe something which does not exist in the nature. Right? So the importance increasing. Even if you are epidemiologist, the, observa the importance of observational study is decreasing and randomized controls, control trials is, is increasing. So that's why we need to learn the many, many skills uh, to develop to solve the problem raised by uncontrolled confounder, like confounding. Uh, because observational study, uh, we need to think about it and then figure it out and do the measurement and then try to control it. But the best part of randomized control trial is that it could be addressed at, by the uh, process of randomization. Okay? It could even control the thing that you, we don't know or it's very expensive or very hard to measure. Right? So that's the key point to make a randomized control trial the best study de design ever. Although it's kind of artificial, Right? A lot of rules to follow, yeah, but they could generate the best evidence compared to all the observational studies. Uh, we could assign the exposure randomly. Uh, then the, the consideration about confounding could be minimized uh, because of that. Uh, so we are, also, we are still, it's kind of push and pull again. Uh, so I call it the dynamic. Uh, we have to take care of the people's health and their benefit. And also we have to take care of the scientific structure of the research, right? So it's a dynamic. So that's the part about today's lecture is uh, the ethical aspects. Uh, these are most happen or requested by the law. So I can tell you it's a little bit um, tedious. Informed consent is uh, required to tell the subjects like, informed consent is a paper, it's a form. It'd be mostly, mostly likely requested by the RB committee to be done in paper or hard copy. But sometimes it, they approve you, they approve the investigator to use the electronic signature. Okay, so informed consent is, uh, is essential no matter it's a paper, hard copy, or uh, electronic copy. Uh, but we have to tell them that they are participating in a research. Uh, it's not, we cannot cheat them that oh, this is a game or something, or there's a lucky draw. No, that's no, not like that. You have to make sure that uh, they are joining the research. And the procedure, uh, so this is something you have to emphasize in the informed consent, okay? You have to remind them the, the risk, no matter how small it is, and the discomfort which might be caused of it, okay? So that's why I beg the investigators to use a smaller or finer needle when I was a research subject because it requested by the law. So I have the right to have a more comfortable way to take the, 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 the treatment or placebo. 
And also you could tell them about the potential benefits, which is not necessary to, uh, to them individually, uh, including those who human society. Uh, it could emphasize the potential benefit if we make a success for this medication or treatment development, it might be beneficial for the people in the future. And also you could uh, put the alternative procedures for a possible advantage to subjects. Uh, so you have alternative, uh, which means that you cannot tell them, you have no choice, you have to follow the rules step by step. Okay? Or you will not get paid. Okay? You cannot say that. And you have to tell the extent to which information gathered will remain confidential. Uh, to make sure, again, that their identity will, will not be stolen, right? And all the information about their uh, existing diseases and, uh, and everything should be um, protected uh, as confidential. And then uh, you have to tell them the compensation generally is money available in event of injury uh, if more than minimal risk involved. Uh, so in America, in America, you might be required to buy insurance specific insurance uh, for the research. But it might depend on the states. I'm not so sure about it. Yeah, but sometimes you are requested to buy insurance uh, for extra medical needs uh, for the participants. Even if they are in a placebo group, okay, you have to buy insurance for them, uh, which, is co which might cost a lot. Okay. And also you need to emphasize that uh, everything you've done here is on voluntary uh, nature of participation. Uh, so you have no right to tell them, if you don't join me, uh, we are going to blah, blah, blah. And they have a right to withdraw without a penalty or any reason. Uh, they could just say, no, I just don't want to do it. I hate you. A uh, loss benefit to which subject might be otherwise be entitled. Uh, these are requested by law. Uh, so we have to do it. And so we have to put those information in the informed consent to make sure that uh, they they have very clear idea about everything, their rights especially. And they will keep a copy. So basically we prepare two copies and the subject will do the signature on both copies. You keep one copy and they keep the other one, right? And prepare to sue you <laughs> afterwards if something happened. Okay, okay, that's it.